Welcome back to the City Current Radio Show. I'm your host, Jeremy Park. We're honored to be with our next guest, Jim Ward. He's the State Director for Tennessee with Ascent Health, Inc. How are you doing, Jim? I'm doing well, thanks. So let's start Ascent Health, Inc. Give us a little bit of history. Started in 2012, but give us some history for Ascent Health. Sure. So um, our company is headquartered in Monroe, Louisiana, and we launched as a nonprofit there when Louisiana started um, coordinated systems of care. And uh, we were contracted to provide high fidelity wraparound services in the state there. Um, over time, we are recognized for the quality of the services that we are providing and our company grew. So we expanded into South Central Louisiana. And then in 2015, um, we decided to launch here in Memphis. Uh, we're structured a little bit differently here in Memphis, um, but we do employ the same values of our company uh, and um, have really had opportunity to serve a lot of families. So talk about those you serve because it is youth and adults and families, as you mentioned. So kind of paint the picture of the individuals, the youth and the adults you work with. Uh, sure. So here in Tennessee, we work with children and their families. And I do want to emphasize families because our approach um, is one that emphasizes the importance of family involvement. And the children that we serve are typically um, children who are having behavioral or mental health issues, and uh, they can be referred to us by anyone, including their parents. Um, and so we are a strengths-based organization. The largest uh, population that we work with is the Medicaid population and typically inner city children who are considered to be at risk. And when you look at, as you mentioned, holistic wraparound, really uh, involving the whole family, kind of paint the picture because you have case management, you have access to therapists, you have the crisis response, so you do a lot elaborate on the different programs and the sides of what you do. Sure, so um, we are contracted with Medicaid. We provide two levels of case management or it's typically referred to as intensive case management. Um, and those are for children who are at risk of being placed in inpatient acute hospitalizations. And so um, what we do is we receive those referrals, uh, conduct an intake assessment, um, you know, during the pandemic, we were providing telehealth services. Um, however, that has gone away now. So we're resuming in-home services. Um, and we take a strengths-based approach. And so uh, rather than just focusing on the problems, one of the things that we believe is really important is to identify the strengths of both the identified client, which could be a child, or if we're working with an adult, it would be the adult, identify their strengths and the strengths of the family, as well as the challenges that they're facing. And then we try to take an approach where we're really maximizing on those strengths to address the problems. And then we're also looking for what we call both formal and informal supports. Uh, so those would be connecting them with the resources that they need as far as professionals, medical services, that type of thing, but also um, really trying to engage people that they are involved with in their everyday lives uh, to assist them in reaching their goals. Carry that forward in the sense of collaboration, because obviously you're working with the individuals, the families, the children, but when you look at the collaborative approach, everything from the kind of the therapist side, the school side, the other nonprofit side, there's a lot of collaboration for what you're doing. Yes. Yeah, so, um, you know, I think probably one of the most important uh, collaborations that we have as far as working with children, it would be with the schools. And so, um, you know, that can be quite challenging, uh, but typically schools are a great source of feedback because they see what's going on when the child is outside of the home. And so when we're able to collaborate with them, we can serve as a bridge uh, for communication between the school and the parents and help build that relationship so that we're making sure that um, behaviors that are occurring at home 
um, are accounted for or accommodated uh, through, you know, interventions at school, but also making sure that they're getting the services that they need at school and then vice versa, uh, trying to address the behaviors that are happening at school uh, at home. Um, you know, other important collaborations, it is important for us to make sure that kids are getting the medical care that they need as far as checkups, vaccinations, those type of things, but then also the psychiatric care that they need if that is something that is indicated as a need. Then, you know, we also want to collaborate with other nonprofits um, who are in the human services field um, because, you know, Memphis is a uh, city that is very rich in resources. Uh, people like to give here. And so we find that, you know, oftentimes families and children and even adults who are struggling are very isolated. And so if we can collaborate with other um, entities to get them connected, we can help build that community of support for them. When you look at school heading back in the fall, what does that mean for you all in terms of opening up the floodgates to work with the schools, work with the children? So kind of going back to your collaboration with the schools, school now resuming in the fall, what does that look like on your end? Well, you know, there's a lot of guesswork that goes with that um, because, you know, although schools did open in March as far as Shelby County schools, um, which is a, that is the primary school system that we work with, many families chose to have their kids uh, still uh, continue with the virtual learning. So I think one of the things that we're looking at is or that we anticipate is that there's this reality that kids have not had the structure that school provides. And so when they return to a very structured environment, um, we anticipate that there's going to be a lot of challenges that they face. Um, whether that's attention span related or other behavioral issues. Um, and you know, it's just not possible uh, for parents to provide the structure as far as an educational uh, setup that a school system does. And so we anticipate there being, you know, quite a bit of needs. But there are, the other thing is, um, you know, kids have gone through a lot with the pandemic. Uh, many children have lost multiple family members. They've had people who've had uh, sickness, uh, you know, with COVID or other things. Um, but their families have also struggled financially, uh, you know, uh, they've struggled to get the basic things that they need. And so um, returning to school really creates a lot of challenges that we anticipate. Um, so trying to meet those challenges and also acknowledge that, you know, for many of these kids, it's been a very traumatic experience when they've already had underlying trauma many times that's not been resolved. What does success look like on your end? And you can illustrate it through the eyes of one of the youth or, you know, when you look at the organization and some of your metrics, what does success look like? Success is really reaching a point. Um, there's multiple facets to it. Of course, we're looking for uh, children or adults to be able to um, function at a level that they're able to do the things in their life that they both need to do, but also that they want to do. Um, and, you know, on other levels, it's things like being able to navigate systems that they may not be familiar with when they come into our care. So knowing how to advocate for themselves in uh, the medical world or in the educational world. And, um, you know, generally success to me is, really um, instilling hope in people. Uh, you know, many times when people first come to us, they're discouraged and oftentimes uh, hope is waning. And so we really wanna be uh, an organization that helps people find hope and inspiration. When you look at, you mentioned the telehealth side on the pandemic, when you look at going through the pandemic and now coming out of it, what's something that you learned as an organization or even on your end personally going through the pandemic that you think is going to make you stronger coming out of it? 
Uh, I think going through the pandemic, um, I think as a whole, we as a society have learned the importance of community. I think we've also probably learned there are a lot of things that maybe we thought were essential um, that are not essential. Um, but there are also things that we took for granted that I hope and believe that we'll now, um, you know, not take for granted. Um, as far as from a mental health perspective, I would say it's really created opportunity for us to get more creative in what we do because engaging people through telehealth is very different. You're limited on what you can see. Um, and there's just a lot of value in being able to uh, actually be in a room with people. Um, and so that I think has strengthened us in many ways um, as far as clinical intervention skills, but there have been a lot of challenges with that as well. So it's a, there, there are many lessons to unpack uh, that will be revealed. Absolutely. What's something that you wish everyone knew about Ascent Health Inc? Oh, goodness. Um, I wish that everyone would know that I think hmm, we are a genuinely uh, caring group of people. Uh, you know, the people that we work with, um, they need people who step in, who genuinely take interest in them and care about them. Um, but we're also professional. Um, we know what we're doing. We're dedicated to helping people improve uh, their lives. Um, we're accessible. And, you know, we're not, as a nonprofit, we're not focused on, you know, making money. It really is, it, we're here to truly serve people. And we're in Memphis because we saw a need. And that's been one of the things that we've always been uh, dedicated to as a company is serving people where there is a need. So that's what I would want people to know. Yeah. Don't name names, but give us an illustration of the power of transformation in terms of what you do. So whether it's an adult or a child, you know, just talk us through the journey of where they were when they came to you. And then obviously kind of where they are either now or just coming out, but paint the picture, illustrate success through the, through the lens of one of the lives that you've touched. Uh, you know, early on when we moved here, uh, when we began services here, uh, I, I, so I'm also a licensed professional counselor, and I began, um, as we were launching here, I felt it was very necessary um, from a financial perspective, but also from a clinical perspective for me to get to know the people that we would be serving. And there is a family that really stands out to me. Um, we started working with the family and, you know, when we met them, they were in desperate circumstances. They were living in, a, in an apartment complex. I won't name the name, but it was, it was condemned. Uh, and, you know, I went there and I did the intake assessment and I also, uh, had a lot of interaction with that family and, um, you know, I think that many times what people, not only in our city, but other cities and other places as well miss is um, the humanity behind what they see on the news, the actual stories. Uh, you can watch it from your living room and it's not as jolting or disturbing as it is when you're actually in the presence of people who are dealing with severe poverty and um, behavioral issues, mental health issues, trauma. Um, it's just, I've had exposure to that. So the family that we worked with, um, you know, one thing that really stands out to me is uh, there was a day that I needed to get some paperwork uh, signed. And so I contacted the mother and she asked if I could meet her at a pediatrician's office uh, to get that paperwork uh, signed. And so I went there and she and I were talking while we were waiting on the nurse to come in. And um, it was very relaxed. Uh, largely because, uh, you know, she knew me. And so when the, the nurse practitioner came in, um, the whole feeling of the room changed. And I sensed that there was fear. And so 
I asked for her permission uh, to, to speak and to assist her. And so I did. And one of the things that I learned from that is that, you know, many people assume that everyone knows what to say and how to communicate and the questions to ask. She didn't. And that is the case of many people that we work with. Um, it's a oftentimes scary and terrifying experience. And so I was able to step in and, you know, let uh, that nurse practitioner know um, some of what was going on, including the severity of their living situation. And within 10 minutes, uh, there a, another person stepped into the room and through collaboration with them, um, we were actually able to get that family relocated. And when I say get them relocated. We assisted them in locating the resources that they needed. So they were able to relocate to somewhere that was safe. And when they did that, we began to see big improvements in their family uh, as far as their mental health goes and the behaviors that the children were going through. So we continued our work um, and they were doing well. We eventually discharged. And I remember sitting in my living room watching the uh, you know nightly news at 10 o'clock. And I was watching and all of a sudden that mother was on the news and she was at her church that she had recently joined. And she was just talking about all the positive things that were happening in her life. And we never want anyone we work with to feel like they have to name that we we're a part of that. Uh, we, uh, seriously, <laughs> we don't want that. We want that they can if they choose to, but we don't want people to feel obligated. But it was such a wonderful feeling to see her on TV um, speaking about how her life had, had improved and remembering um, the broken woman that I first encountered who loved her kids and was really struggling to be in a stable place and doing well. Um, and so that's one case of success that really stands out to me. Yeah, that's awesome. What can we do to help? How can the community help? Um, you know, on an over, like on a big scale, um, what I would say is one of the most important things that is needed is um, we need mentors. We need people who are willing to dedicate even just a little time and invest in um, the youth in our city and in the families. Um, unfortunately, I think many people are fear driven and they make um, suppositions about what people are like and who live in certain areas or zip codes. And, you know, speaking from my personal experience, I've always been welcomed. Um, and, you know, we need people who are willing to step in and give of their time and provide, use their expertise to help people. But also, even if they're not experts in a certain thing, it's simple things like dedicating some time to just be a mentor to a kid, spend time with them, um, help them learn to read better, different things like that. But then also sharing resources. And I don't just mean writing a check. Time is a resource, uh, you know, knowledge about different things that are available. That's a resource that's so badly needed. And last thing is, where do we go to help? So website, social media, where would you direct us? Yes, you can find us at um, ascentlife.org under Memphis. Um, you can call us at 901 206 2222. Uh, and then we're also on Facebook as Ascent Memphis. Well, Jim Ward, State Director for Tennessee, Ascent Health Inc., thank you for all you and your team do. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you.